So unless you've been on a desert island for the last year or so, you know that at the end of Top Gun Maverick, Maverick with Rooster in his back seat engages the barricade at the aircraft carrier because he can't get his nose gear down. So what's it like to do that in real life? Well, to find out, I wanted to talk to my longtime good friend, Tom Page, veteran Tomcat pilot, who, oh, by the way, had his barricade at night and in bad weather. And this is kind of overdue in that, you know, I, I knew that Pager had a great story to tell. You told the, this story years ago in the pages of Approach Magazine when I was the editor back in like 90, 91 time frame. But you and I go back even farther than that to the Naval Academy. And a lot of times, you know, we're like, oh, we're classmates. and But you and I really knew each other at the Academy. Oh, yeah. And we had a particular adventure during one summer uh, the what our what we call our first class cruise where we went to Hawaii. Um, so let's tell the folks what you remember about that. Well, uh, repelling out of a helicopter at 100 feet. I was the, I don't know if you remember I was the first one out the hell hole, and uh, the guy said the last mid group they they uh, had the the rope too short so the guy kept on getting banged underneath the helicopter so he pulls in like 20 feet and i'm sitting there at the hell hole looking down at all everybody else and he's like okay ready i'm like are you sure this is gonna work i've got my brake on and i go out and it's like a two second free fall i hit my feet go above my head with the recoil my helmet comes off and guys are going Oh my God, it looks like you got decapitated. I yeah. do remember that. I, I, in my mind's eye, I can see that happening. So, oh my God, we're talking about an H 46. The right. hell hole is the, the middle opening in the middle right. of a fuselage in the, you know, the compartment, the, 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 the cabin. And this is when we spent a week with the recon guys. Right. And, and we're doing what's called the Marine option cruise out at Kaneohe. Uh, Cause uh, you know, I guess we were thinking about going Marine Corps at some level. Well, your dad was a Marine Corps officer, as was mine. My dad was a uh, was an air traffic controller, and and he was like always, "Hey, if you want to be on the JVs, go ahead and go for the Navy. But if you really want to be on the varsity, well, then you gotta you gotta give the Marines a shot." Remember the spy rig? Also, there's eight of us hanging below the helicopter, cruising around Kaneohe. It's like. This is this is an e-ticket ride right here. People would pay thousands of dollars, and we're getting to do this for free. I remember looking down at Ernie Matakata, you know, and then below, below him, there were hammerhead sharks, right? And we come back there. Oh yeah, that's that bay is full of hammerhead sharks. You know, I'm like, well, I'm glad the rope didn't give out, right? If we didn't die at impact, we'd die from being attacked by hammerhead sharks. But no the most influential thing that happened to us out there in terms of our future service selection was we got to fly. And I think you had, you had two hops out there, right? Did you, you had at least two hops. I had gotten the summer prior, I had gotten backseat qualified. So when we get to Kaneohe, uh, we're waiting for our Phantom rides. I head over to the Hams uh, squadron, the A4 squadron. And they've got a couple TA4s. So I get in a couple TA4 rides first. And then... The Phantom Rhine shows up. It's me and Fitz uh, in, a, in a section. And Fitz is like, Tommy, I'm hungry. I'm, I'm going to get something to eat. I'm like, Fitz, I don't know if that's a good idea. And he goes, oh, I'm starving. So he gets a couple Polish dogs, looks them down, and, he, and he, he, he drinks like a cherry Coke or something, a red liquid drink. And Ward, after our Phantom Ride, you know, supersonic and all that, Phantom pulls up alongside us and Fitz holds up his white barf bag with, and I can see it's a red liquid with things floating in it. I'm like, dude, I told you, never should have done that. So we're talking about there were two F4J squadrons out there, VMFA 232 and VMFA 235. The other third squadron, I forget which number, was deployed while we were there. But I flew with 235. Who did you guys fly with? I flew with 232. Suffice to say that that summer cruise influenced your service selection, which was Navy pilot. We didn't go Marine Navy Corps time. Air. We went right. Navy Air. Me, NFOU yeah. pilot. Right. So 
When were you TAD to Top Gun? Was it before or after flight school? Uh, before flight school. I mean, right after graduation, I was backing up service selection night. Um, picked, you know, got got a pilot slot, and the the class dates available were five days after graduating or nine months later. I said, well, I'm playing lacrosse, and we always are in the national hunt for the national championship. And that usually goes right after near graduation time to even after. So I did not want to be plucked out. Needs of the Navy. Hey, your, your flight school billet is tomorrow. Yeah, but I, I have a game to play. They would have said, see ya. So I said, you know what? I'm going to, I'll go nine months and you know, what do I do then? And the, and the quote was, uh, we suggest you find a job or we'll find one for you. And I was like, say no more. So I called the guy that recruited me and said, hey, do you have anybody at, at Miramar, one of your guys, that because you've been doing this for years? And he said, I think I do. And two weeks later, I get a, a, a note to go to the OD's office. I'm like, uh-oh, did, I, did they catch me going over the wall? What's going on? And it's the JV lacrosse coach who was the officer of the day. And uh, he was a phantom guy. R uh, Rich Johnson was his name. And he goes, I got a call from one of my classmates today requesting your presence out at, at Miramar for your TAD stash job. I'm like, really? And he goes, yeah. I said, what, what squadron? He goes, Navy Fighter Weapons School. Never heard of it. I go, oh, is, is that good? And he goes, you want to do this. This will be a very good job to have. And I said, okay, sounds good. So I showed up with my day tops jacket, you know, met the guys and their brief was anytime there's an open back seat, you got it, but you have to make the brief and you got to go to the debrief, sit through everything. And I'm like, perfect. I'm a sponge. I'm going to, that's why I'm here. I want to, want to learn. And next thing you know, uh, hundred hours of backseat F5 time in nine months. Yeah. So this, by your own admission, gave you an advantage going into oh, flight school, right? Huge. Helped huge. you get jet grades. Um, and obviously you were aero adapted to the max, you know, so. Right. The guys who are blowing chow on the T-34 and the other things that happen, you're like, whatever, you know, you yeah. could focus on, you know, talking yeah, on the radio exactly. and hit your numbers and all of that sort of right. stuff. There was no anxiety that other FAM-1 guys had to face. Correct. You got jet grades. You select which which T-2 and A-4 squadrons were you in? I was in v, uh, Kingsville, VT-23, and then VT-21, uh, A-4 squadron. The, the, the turning point there was uh, my first ACM hop. I'd already called the boat, and now we're doing ACM, and uh, which was the last phase. And I'm with the uh, XO of the squadron, a guy named Dave Erickson, uh, call sign Trant, and he's a Tomcat pilot from uh, Phantom slash Tomcat pilot, uh, West Coast. So we, we, we fly the hop, and we get back to the debrief, and he goes, okay, what gives? What, what's the story? And I'm like, sir? And he goes, you got the picture. I mean, what? And I, and I told him about my stash job. And he goes, oh, okay, that, that, that answers that. So unbeknownst to me, he went down to the opso and said, I want to be in this guy's back seat for the next, at least a couple of his hops. So Ward, on the, on the last uh, final A4 hop, uh, another Tomcat guy, Bernard Miles in uh, the other jet, we're doing a rolling scissors, and I'm, I'm literally – looking at his kneeboard card. I mean, we are tight and we're just going after it. And it was, it was just like three or four years later, uh, you know, at Top Gun in, in the single seat A4, it was just surreal what we were doing. And we get back to, and I was just so pumped up and just so energized by it. And then the skipper goes, hey, Tom, you're, you're going to fly fighters. And I'm like, awesome. And he goes, but first you're going to be one of my surgery rats. And I'm like, shot to the heart. Oh my God, Skipper. He was a skipper at the time. Uh, and I'm like, well, what? I, I'm working so hard. And and he goes, hey, trust me, you, you'll get what you want. But when you become a skipper in the XO, you stack the deck and you're one of my guys. Work hard. Uh, give me 18 good months and, and you'll get what you want. And I was like, okay. So just to remind the viewers what a surgrad is. Surgrad is once you get your wings, you don't go to the fleet, you come back and now you're an instructor 
right. in in your case in in, in A fours. Right. So yeah. it holds you back, but you show up to the fleet with, like you said, more hours and more flight time, and so you're, oh, yeah. you're a junior pilot, but you've got a lot of practical experience. And I know that right. you know squadrons love having a couple of sir grads in the mix. Finish the sir grad tour, go to VF one twenty four, the West Coast Tomcat rag, and then wind up in which fleet squadron? Uh, VF two bounty hunters. Okay, aboard. Which ship? Or the US, USS Ranger. And uh, while I was in the RAG, because of my uh, Sir Grad experience, um, and I did pretty well at the boat, they put me in the must pump uh, category. They they give you the, your dream sheet. Where, where do you want to go? And I thought, well, I want to go to a squadron that has just gotten back from cruise. So I get a year, year and a half workup, get into you know, how a fleet squadron works, get some experience, and then go on cruise. Well, so I, I put down all the, the three squadrons, and then uh, I handed it to the, the OPSO, and he goes, well, you're slated to go to VF2, and they leave on cruise right around, you know, a week before you're done. So my plan, of course, is now 180 out of what they want me to do. Uh, but it was okay, because I, I knew some guys in VF2, and they had kind of, they had kind of requested me. They, they, you know, had an AOM and said, who are the, who are our choices? And my name got thrown in there. So they said, okay, uh, that's who we want. And uh, so I got the hook at the, uh, in my rag class. And then I got, I went to SEER school. And when I got out of SEER school, the ship had already left the, uh, like a week earlier. So I, have to jump on uh i think they had just left hawaii and i had to go through diego garcia on a us3 to get out to the ship i did kind of the same thing in terms of finish the rag and go right on cruise uh, i think there are some advantages to you know advantages to that like you said it's it would be great to have a full turnaround cycle but right. that sort of forced immersion that that you know being there for, for day one of the season uh, without doing any of the spring training has its advantages. Uh, would you agree with that? Uh, yes and no. There are advantages and disadvantages. I love the fact of you're getting, you know, baptism by fire. You just get thrown in and, and you know, sink or swim. So uh, I was, re I felt I was ready for that. I was confident with my flying, um, you know, at the boat, I did very well. So, but it was, you know, it's just a new environment. I'll never forget walking on board, you know, meeting everybody. And then I go down to the stateroom and we were right uh, below cat two. So right next to the waste cats and there's a night launch going and just started. And I hear, you know, Tomcat after Tomcat, I mean, deafening. You can't even hear yourself think in your, in your room. And my new roommate, you know, is showing me, where my bunk is going to be and all that. I said, does this happen every night? How do you get sleep? And he goes, he goes, trust me, you won't hear it by the end of the week. It's just, it's completely black in here and you'll be out. I'm like, okay. So that cruise ends. You got the turnaround training period. You are selected. And this is a big deal to be the pilot that goes to Top Gun for the squadron. And so obviously things went well. But now you're on your second deployment on Ranger. So walk us through this fateful day. Middle of May or beginning of May, 89, uh, we're in the Indian Ocean, Blue Water Ops, and I'm about ready to get out of night qual. So I have, it's been five days since my last night trap. So they have, you know, a little AIC air intercept mission. Basically just have the Rios work the radars We'll go max conserve, just be different aspects, and then come back and get my my night landing to get me back into currency. So what um, month of the cruise is this? How long have you guys been on deployment at this point? Uh, let me see. This is around the third, I want to say around the third month, so pretty much midway through cruise. Okay. We brief it up, and uh, the only thing of interest of the the – the brief is the weather. The weather is pretty, uh, pretty nasty. Um, thunderstorms throughout uh, every quadrant. 
lightning, heavy rain. So, you know, of course, we're you know, in the back of our heads going, you know, you can't bike training like this, but I'd, I'd rather be eating a slider than, than, you know, flying in this kind of weather. It just is not comfortable. So anyway, get to the jet, pre-flight it, dripping wet, jump in there. And uh, my backseater, Rico, uh, Ricky Jordan, and I are chatting back and forth saying, nah, this is not going to go. I mean, and all of a sudden they, they give the breakdown and they start unchaining us. And next thing you know, we go up to the cat and off we launch. Um, probably one of the things that maybe was an indicator this might not be a normal flight is that uh, on the cat stroke, as soon as I get the gear up, I, I have to take my mask off because my locks bottle must have disconnected. There was, I was not getting any oxygen at all. So mask is off for the duration of the flight, which is not really uncommon. We've all flown without masks before, but it, uh, it's a little bit of annoyance, especially when you're getting bounced around going through embedded thunderstorms and <laughs> getting whacked with the mask. Um, so anyway, we, we get through the uh, microbursts and the heavy winds, finally break out. And right around the time we break out, we get a call from uh, the ship saying, hey, we've decided the weather's getting worse, so time to come on back. And uh, so they start giving us vectors, and I think we're the second airplane down, and uh, we have to dump a good six or 8,000 pounds of gas, which while I was doing it was not really uh, excited about that. Just, you know, you want to, you know, gas is flight time and, and life. So, uh, but anyway, I had to get to max strap weight. So ended up dumping the gas and got bounced around pretty good to the point where uh, Ricky uh, said I had told him that I had the leans a little bit, um, which I, I don't really remember, but I wrote it in the article, so I, I guess I did. Um, but I do remember getting th thrashed around pretty good, pretty violently. Um, so with that, we come down, and on my first pass, uh, once I finally break out, uh, it I couldn't salvage what start I had, and I, I think I bolted. They said, okay, go ahead and go into uh, Delta Easy, because I guess there was a an A6 that had a wet compass issue, uh, and he, was, he had become max priority at that point, so we were just kind of put into a low-holding pattern. Then we there we sat for probably 20 to 30 minutes and uh you know our gas getting a little bit lower and lower and there it now sounded like uh the ship and cag started getting a, a plan together to start uh launching some maxi tankers and actually being proactive and taking uh most of the planes airborne going to masira which was around 500 miles four to 500 miles away so they started launching a maxi, putting two fighters on them and saying, divert. And that's two, two less that they have to worry about. And at the time, too, uh, what was really uh, distracting, they had three uh, tanker patterns set up. It, you can imagine if you're, you've got a lot of weather around, you, know, you can't just do the standard CV ops overhead the ship, 30 degree angle bank turn. You're going to have to find some smooth, smoother air and clearer skies versus embedded, you know, lightning and whatnot. So, and that was all happening on one frequency. So it was really uh, distracting. And we also knew we are low priority. So we're just, you know, zip lipped and listen to everything going on, but also keeping an eyeball on the, on the two tapes that are slowly starting to get a little bit lower. Uh, finally, when we get, we, we pipe up when we, I think we got to around 2.0 and said, Hey, you know, we're going to start needing some gas. And right around that time an S3 came up, uh, Timmy Schaefer shaft was the pilot. He goes, I have a thousand pounds of gas to give. So, uh, Ricky said, we'll take it. Where are you at? So we kind of coordinated our own, uh, rendezvous. Uh, we got the okay from the ship. They said, yeah, yeah give them a thousand, give them as much as you can. And uh, so we took the thousand pounds from Tim and, and things were starting to work out 
perfectly timing wise because just as we were finishing up getting our gas, the Maxi A6 tanker that had launched, you know, 15, 10 minutes earlier was now joining on us. So it was great. Timmy, you know, kissing you off. And now we swap leads and I go ahead and join on the A6. He brings his basket out and uh, go ahead and hit it. And he goes, yeah, I don't show you in the basket. I'm like, well, I'm there. And Rico is saying, yeah, no, no flow. So I have to unplug, plug again. And again, or, you know, I, we've all flown in bad weather before, but trying to tank at 1500 feet with a basket and uh, with lightning and just, it, it was the most, probably the most challenging thing I've done uh, flying the, the Tomcat. Um, but we got in the second time. It was one of that you could just kind of slid in and got it. And then it's like, okay, I'm in. I can see that I'm in. And he goes, yeah, no flow. And it's like, okay, pulled it out. And now it's like cannonball coming. Boom, I hit it and get the nice little sine wave up. Lucky that it didn't come back and rip the probe off, but it didn't. And he goes, yeah, no, we're, we must be a sour tanker. So Rico at that time says, tell you what, why don't you go ahead and recycle your your drogue and see if that doesn't change things. So he brings his his basket in. It doesn't go all the way in. And then he, when he brings it back out, the entire hose just falls into the uh, water, just departs the jet. There it goes. So it's like, okay, well, uh, not going our way at that point. And right around then is when we are back to 2.0 on the gas. And because of trying to find smooth air, you know, the A6 picked his way through. And now we're a little bit further away from mother than we had wanted to. And there's a the, the big cell uh, that the ship was working under uh, is now between the ship and ourselves. So we have to go all the way around this monstrous thing. And that's when the uh, CAD comes up and says, hey, we're going to have to barricade you. I mean, the emotion that uh, that I felt, it really came back to my second pass because my second pass, um, I'm sitting there working hard, you know, on and on in the needles. And I look up and I don't see the ship. So I'm, I'm back down working, come back out. I don't see the ship. I'm like, what's going on? All of a sudden, I see something out of the corner of my eye. And the ship is 45 degrees off. So we are literally coming in at a 45 degree crab. And I find out later from the LSOs that they were, they were trying to find, uh, you know, clear air. And, and because of the turbulent winds that are changing in the thunder area, they said it was 50 degrees off at like 50 knots. And I finally saw the ship, kind of made a play for it. Paddle saw that and, you know, now nah, this is not going to work. Wave me off. That was my second pass. So I'm thinking to myself when I hear CAG say that, oh my gosh, you know, I bolter, I took a, you know, I was waved off. I'm like, Skipper, I didn't see, or, you know, CAG, I didn't see the ship until the very last minute. And he's like, no, no, no. He goes, you hit the number where we just, the SOP number, we're just going to have to barricade you. The reason that we have to barricade you is because if you bolter, you're going to flame out before you can come back around. Right. So this is the last yeah. chance. So you hear the word barricade and, and what, how do you even process that? Had never even thought, ever thought of a barricade. And in, in that whole situation, I was thinking more of ejection, you know, uh, if we're going to run out of gas. But uh, barricade, it didn't never cross my mind until it was said. And then it was like, okay, well, you know, just I've, I've heard of them. You know, we've gone, you know, gotten our briefs from CAG LSOs and, uh, you know, safety stand downs, talking about barricades and the, the A3, that accident that happened a couple years prior where all those guys died. You know, so we we knew barricade, but that was my uh, only experience was hearing about a guy taking his own wave off and, you know, killing X number of people. So, but it was almost at that point where you, you kind of shift into just really, uh, Hyper focus, you know, things are really you're aware of everything and um, just concentrating big time. 
I can't say enough about Rico in the backseat. As as they say, as cool as the other side of the pillow. I mean, he was he's a good old Southern boy from North Carolina, and just never never any angst or anxiety or you know higher pitched voice. Just you know monotone, very cool, collective, calm. So um, that was really great. But uh, so we got briefed by the CAG CAG paddles cam, comes up, gives us the their spiel. Um, and in the meantime, they're just telling us, you know, we're going to try to set you up for a six, seven mile straight in approach and don't take your wave off in close. Uh, we want to make sure that you go, we're going to call cut, 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 which is against anything you've ever done landing at the boat. So all those years of FCLP training, you know, you're going to do the exact opposite. Which means they instead it. of advancing the throttles at touchdown, you're going to go to basically idle. turn the engines. Yeah. To, to, uh, yeah, pull, pull them to idle as you're crossing right. the ramp. So they go through all that spiel. And, and as they're doing that, um, as we're getting closer to the ship, they come up and they say, hey, you know what? Why don't you give us a 360? Uh, they need a little bit more time to to rig the barricade. It's like, okay. So um, start a 360. And I look down at the, the fuel tapes and they're showing around 1,200 pounds at that point. Now my, uh, you know, Natops studying days was like, okay, fuel gauge error, three to 400 pounds per side. So it could be off by 800 pounds. So I could only have 400 pounds of fuel if, if they're reading on the high side. So that's a little, concer- a little concerning to me. So halfway through the turn, I, I tell Ricky to, uh, Take his kneeboard off, tighten down his straps. Let's get everything ready to go because if this thing ends up flaming out, uh, we're probably going to go for a ride. And, oh, by the way, the whole time I have to be talking like this and flying because my my mask is dangling, right, because I don't have any oxygen. So not a big deal, but distracting. It's just another distractor to – what you want to be, you know, a very focused uh, event. So anyway, we talk about that. And I, and I tell Ricky also, uh, you're going to punch us out because I'm going to be busy flying the jet, especially if we're on short final, uh, you're going to, you're going to punch us out. So I'm just going to yell, eject, 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 and the chips will fall where they fall. So anyway, by the time we are briefing that we're now, back uh, on final bearing coming in and we get to around, I want to say maybe a mile and a half, two miles and LSOs come up and say, go ahead and give me one more 360 here, Tom. And I'm thinking to myself, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> what? So are okay. you trying to make me flame out here? I mean, what are you guys doing? <laughs> right. No, no, exactly. So uh, as I start that turn, uh, I look down at the tapes and now it's showing 900 pounds on the totalizer. And uh, I hadn't said a word outside the cockpit until that point when I kind of did the, leaned over, keyed the UHF and said, and they immediately said, okay, turn. And they gave us the final bearing. So we were halfway through the turn when I said that and they just said, keep it coming. So we turn, uh, we turn the final. And because of that, it was an overshooting start, uh, so I was working a little bit right. So I got a, you know, a fair amount of you know come left calls just because of the way the initial turn was. Yeah, really honk that lineup, get her on center line way out there. Ricky called the ball with uh, 600 pounds. Okay, we got a clear deck. Call the ball. Come on, Tom, that ball six up. Okay, right, your ball. Flew the best pass I could. Heard the cut, cut, cut calls. Chopped it to idle, uh, touched down, and kind of saw something. You know, we, we both kind of did a flinch because as the barricade engulfed the airplane, it was something I didn't see it until it was there. Good barricade. Good engagement. Nice job, Peter. So, did the canopy open, or did you have to wait for the crash crew, or? We had to wait for the, the crash crew to cut the the barricade off of the jet. 
So I have never seen three digits on a totalizer, right? And I I would record that ball call. I, I've never heard anybody call 600 pounds. How do you even call that? Point six? What do you say? Well, what he said. That's 6,000 pounds. He goes, yeah, I, I blew it. But he, I, because he's never called a ball like that before either. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that would, you'd have to like consciously think about it. Exactly. Right? Yeah. 10, you know, 20 minutes later, whenever we were in the ready room and I'm getting ready to start, you know, writing up a little after actions report in walks munch. And he goes, 90 seconds. I go, what? He goes, you had 90 seconds of gas left. I'm like, thanks munch. But you know, wow. it's yeah. And then CAG came in and uh, shook my hand, thanked me. And he goes, uh, do you know how close I was to having you pull up alongside and just punch it out? And I'm like, no, sir, I did not. And I'm very happy. So was the airplane just, were the slats damaged or did it fly again? What 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 happened It did, it did fly again. Yeah, the slats were damaged. Um uh, my my question in when I was in the red room was, what's what was with the two three sixties? I mean, come on, rigging a barricade. When they say rig the barricade, ninety seconds later that thing's supposed to be up. And um, we had heard, and I, it's a, we heard that you know night or the next day that it was rigged upside down. I thought those things were like in there and then you just, you just pull it out. But su supposedly it was rigged upside down and it went up and the, the QA chief saw the big steel cable right around neck level and went, uh, uh, no, we got to bring this thing back down and swap ends or, you know, turn it around. It took almost nine and a half minutes to, to raise it. Wow. Um, well, had you so, flamed out, that would have been a not good circumstance. Oh. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. every day till the end of cruise was a rig the barricade drill on board the Ranger. It Ranger happened, not. you know, yeah. So. They got good. They got good. They got really good at it. Yeah. So, Pager, we'll have you on again to talk about your time as a Top Gun instructor. But thanks for coming aboard this episode and telling us about this uh, barricade situation, a harrowing event indeed. Thanks, Ward. Thanks for having me. All right. That'll do it for this episode. If you're not already a subscriber, become one so you don't miss anything going forward. If you'd like to help support the channel, please consider using the super thanks, the heart icon below, or become a patron at patreon.com slash Ward Carroll. And in the meantime, I look forward to talking to you again very soon.